Yvonne had been in a bad mood since the morning. It wasn't even because her mother-in-law, Michaela, was feeling unwell again. Lately, problems at work had made it difficult for Yvonne to concentrate and drained her energy. And now came the scandalous dismissal. At night, she tossed and turned, staring at the ceiling. The blame lay squarely on the new principal, Mr. Martin, a man of new formation, who had decided to revolutionise their high school. Yvonne Bright had been teaching language and literature for seven years, without a single complaint from her superiors. Now, shamefully, she had become the centre of scandal and public scrutiny among colleagues twice in one week. Remember, you can't work as you used to, Mr. Martin had bellowed. I'll set things straight, you hear? Yvonne had lowered her head guiltily. What could she say? It was clear that the new principal favoured the rich and ignored the less privileged students. But Yvonne didn't discriminate. She evaluated students solely on their knowledge. Mr. Martin had disliked this from the start, and so Yvonne's dismissal was all but certain. With a heavy sigh, Yvonne got out of bed to prepare her husband's breakfast. Cyrus was leaving for a long business trip today, which meant she would again be left to care for her mother-in-law and cater to her every whim. Hearing Yvonne's cautious footsteps in the corridor, her mother-in-law grumbled. "'When will breakfast be ready, Yvonne? I've been awake for half an hour, and not a morsel has passed my lips.' Yvonne wrinkled her nose, but still managed a pleasant reply to lighten the mood. She'd already fought with Cyrus last night. She didn't want to quarrel with her mother-in-law, too. Her husband was already up, pacing the kitchen with a scowl. From his demeanour, Yvonne instantly knew something unpleasant awaited her. "'Yvonne, I've been thinking,' Cyrus began. "'Since you've been fired, I can help you with a new job.' She sighed sadly. Oh, how can you help me? Call the Ministry of Education? That's absurd. I'll figure it out myself. Cyrus snorted. Yourself, you say? No one will hire you after this dismissal. I know, Mr. Martin. Once he's angry with someone, he doesn't stop at just dismissal. What are you getting at, Cyrus? Yvonne asked, puzzled. What am I getting at? Sitting idle isn't a solution. I've got a promising job for you, one that could bring us a fat profit, her husband snapped. Yvonne tensed visibly. Her husband's suggestions were usually, to put it mildly, less than virtuous. There's this businessman. He's ill. The doctors have given up on him. So Christopher's gone off to die in the middle of nowhere, away from everyone. But he can't manage alone. He needs care. He says he'll leave his inheritance to whoever looks after him. I could really use that money now. It's not a big deal. Christopher's only got a month or two to live. But his money's real, and his business is profitable. If you care for him until his end, you'll be a businesswoman. You're clinging to that school like a fool. Care for him? But I'm not a nurse. I'm a teacher, Cyrus. Yvonne objected. Her husband frowned. What difference does it make? You're a teacher. Fine. Just look after the man and wait for the inheritance. His words made her feel sick. What are you saying? You want to send your wife to some backwards place to watch a dying man? Why doesn't the businessman hire a proper nurse, someone with skills and experience? Yvonne asked uncertainly. Cyrus waved his hand dismissively. He says he's already tried a dozen, and none were suitable. But I think he'll like you. He says he's already tried a dozen, and none were suitable. But I think he'll like you. Yes, my dear, why stay at home? You might help, Christopher, said the mother-in-law, who had just entered. At first, Yvonne thought her husband was joking. But when Michaela got involved... Everything fell into place. They're conspiring, taking advantage of her vulnerable state. Cyrus, I'm not going. Let him find someone else, Yvonne said, her voice trembling. 
but her husband's face changed instantly. If that's how it is, I consider it betrayal. You know I have problems at work, competitors breathing down my neck, and every penny counts now, and you're throwing away such opportunities to earn money. And by the way, you're unemployed now. It would be better to take up tutoring. See what could have come of it, her mother-in-law chimed in. Tears of resentment welled up in Yvonne's eyes as she thought. And Michaela, of course, is fine. She let herself sit at home and live off her son, while I was fired only yesterday, and already there's such accusation. Suddenly Yvonne felt indifferent to what would happen next, or whether she'd ever find work in her field again. Why not really go to the middle of nowhere, at least for a week, not for the inheritance, but for some peace and quiet? To go to the forest, like before with her grandmother, to sit by the river watching the lazy waves, and most importantly, not to see the annoying faces of her mother-in-law and husband, who were ashamed of her. Yvonne used to find solace at work, but now, but now, she had lost that kind of place. Okay, Cyrus, I agree. Give me the address and warn this businessman. I can't give injections, but I'll help in any other way, Yvonne said, her voice still shaky. Cyrus glanced furtively at his mother, smiled and began to write down the address. Yvonne went to her room and started packing. She felt she was making a rash decision, but she was concerned. But she saw no other way out. Her husband didn't even bother to call her a cab, sending her by bus instead. Since it was summer, Yvonne didn't take much with her, just a small suitcase with the essentials. Christopher Hoover owned a house in a village an hour's drive from the city. The man had inherited it from his late grandfather, and he planned to spend his last days there, just as he had once spent his summer vacations. The bus was stifling, but Yvonne was fortunate to have a window seat, where she could catch a breath of fresh air. Passengers chatted excitedly, grumbling about the oppressive heat. The driver, visibly agitated, could do little to help, as his old bus lacked air conditioning. Mercifully, clouds soon appeared, bringing a slight drop in temperature. A gentle breeze wafted through the cabin, tousling Yvonne's hair, while sunlight danced on the windows, painting a mosaic of light and shadow across the seats. Outside, a typical May scene unfolded. Verdant meadows, speckled with flowers, a vibrant blue sky adorned with fluffy clouds, and a sparkling river meandering in the distance. The serene landscape instilled a sense of peace and carefree bliss in Yvonne and most of the passengers. Unconsciously, her thoughts drifted back to the day of her dismissal. It had all begun with a phone call that had thrown her life into disarray, a call from one of her students' mothers, who had decided to voice her opinions directly to the teacher. "'Mrs. Bright, you must understand, this is crucial for Mickey. Why does my son have a C in your subject? He's an excellent student in all other subjects and suspecting prejudice.' Mrs. Campbell's voice crackled with undisguised irritation. As a wife of a successful businessman, she felt entitled to meddle in every aspect of her son's life, including his school grades. "'Mrs. Campbell, I understand your concern.' But this grade reflects Mickey's actual knowledge, Yvonne replied calmly, despite the storm of indignation brewing within her. Mrs. Bright, you know how talented Mickey is. He was just a bit distracted. Please, I implore you, reconsider his grade. It's so important for him, Mrs. Campbell persisted. Look, I can't alter grades at your or anyone else's request. As a teacher, it's my duty to remain objective throughout the educational process. Furthermore, with all due respect, I don't see any extraordinary talent in Mickey. He merely completes his homework without putting in the necessary effort. So please, don't accuse me of incompetence or unwillingness to help. I'm always open to dialogue and assisting students. But I won't allow anyone to question my professionalism. Yvonne retorted, before ending the call. Upon entering the teacher's lounge at school, 
Yvonne felt Mr. Martin's unfriendly gaze. The new principal was notorious for his penchant for scheming and favouring children of wealthy parents. Mr. Martin never missed a chance to flaunt his status and exploit his position to the fullest. Yvonne, I'm aware of the conversation with Mrs. Campbell. Trust me, you should agree with her. She's only concerned about her son, the principal said reproachfully. Mr. Martin, I cannot and will not change my mind. I refuse to participate in these behind-the-scenes games, Yvonne replied firmly. Oh, Yvonne, you know how life works. Not everything can be solved strictly by the book. You need to be more flexible, make concessions, especially in matters like these. The principal objected. I won't be flexible on this matter. I'm a teacher. My job is to educate children, not to please their parents, Yvonne replied, her tone firmer than she intended. Very well. Do as you see fit. I merely remind you not to quarrel with influential people, the principal hissed. At that moment, Yvonne realised her honesty and principles had placed her in a difficult position. She didn't want to make concessions or change her assessment, yet she also tried to maintain a good relationship with the new management. Lost in thought, Yvonne entered the classroom and immediately felt the heavy gaze of fifteen-year-old Mickey, who sat at the back, glaring at her with undisguised hatred. "'Good morning, everyone. Remember we have a test today,' Yvonne said calmly, masking her emotions. "'Oh, really? Don't you know I can't take a test because of my busy training schedule? You should have thought of that earlier. I can't waste time on your useless subject,' Mickey retorted with insolence and contempt. Yvonne frowned. "'Mickey, this discussion is pointless.' You must fulfil your school duties like everyone else. I'm a teacher, and I know my job. I'm going to be a professional athlete and then go into business like my father. I'm putting all my energy into sports, and school is just a waste of time, the teenager objected. Mickey, you seem to have forgotten that as a student, you have no right to speak to me like that. You must take the test like all the other students, Yvonne replied, emphasising the last phrase. And if I don't want to, what will you do? Give me another C? My mum will still get the principal to change it to an A, because my father has already promised to renovate the computer lab and even provide new computers. The young troublemaker sneered. Mickey, your behaviour has crossed all limits. I don't tolerate rudeness and disrespect, and I won't make concessions. If you refuse to fulfil your obligations as a student, I'll have to summon your parents to school, Yvonne exclaimed. The other students in the classroom fell silent. They hadn't seen Mrs. Bright like this in a long time. Anger flashed in Mickey's eyes. You think I'm scared of your threats? My mother will settle everything in my favour, and you'll be left jobless. Nobody wants you any more, do you hear? I'll do whatever I want anyway. Yvonne could no longer tolerate his antics. Get out of the classroom. I'm done talking to you. Mickey stood up defiantly, lazily walked to the door and left, slamming it loudly in farewell. Yvonne sat at her desk and tried to calm down. Her hands were shaking, and her head was spinning as if she might faint. She decided to talk to the school principal that afternoon, to find out what could be done to avoid a conflict with Mickey's parents. Yvonne, I certainly understand your situation, but you must realise Mrs. Campbell is a very influential woman who can seriously affect the school's reputation. I suggest you find common ground with her and avoid conflicts. The principal began, falling into his familiar routine. Yvonne wasn't going to give in, feeling justified in her position. But where is it acceptable for a student to speak to a teacher like that and to throw hurtful remarks in her face? But the principal had his own view of the situation. Mrs. Bright, you're so unapproachable and principled, and you know I've already received calls, even from the mayor's office. Just don't touch Mickey Campbell. Is it so hard for you to give him a normal grade? 
Excuse me, but what's normal? Yvonne asked, barely containing her agitation. Mr. Martin turned purple. What's normal? Are you kidding? Mrs. Bright, an A, of course. Do you think this is all a joke? If you were in my shoes, we'd see how you'd sing. You're running a kindergarten here. I don't want this. I don't want that. Why are you talking to me like this? Don't I deserve to be treated with respect? Yvonne exclaimed. If you don't like it, write your resignation and get out. I'm not going to coddle you here. You're too picky. There are plenty of people like you out there. The kind who'll be more agreeable. Tears welled up in Yvonne's eyes. She barely remembered what happened afterward. She wrote her resignation that same day, spending her last hours in this school. As a parting shot, Mr. Martin promised her a cheerful life, thanks to his connections in the ministry. It was too painful to even remember, let alone mention aloud. That's why her husband didn't know all the details, believing that she had been fired for cause. Waking from the abyss of unpleasant memories, Yvonne saw that the bus was smoothly slowing down as the next stop appeared ahead. She looked closer and exhaled with relief. It was her destination, a godforsaken place surrounded on three sides by forests and swamps. But Yvonne wasn't upset. On the contrary, it was exactly the journey her tormented soul needed now. Of course, she wasn't thinking about any inheritance from Christopher Hoover. Why should she? Cyrus would handle everything, negotiate, nothing but trouble. Business isn't for everyone. It requires wit and intuition, not just buying low and selling high. Stepping out of the stuffy bus, Yvonne turned and caught the sympathetic look of the elderly driver, which literally saying to her, Well, where have you come to, dear? This isn't the city. Life here has its own pace, slow and measured. Yvonne smiled and waved goodbye to the driver. She picked up her suitcase and set off along the dirt road leading to the settlement. Despite the sweltering heat, her mood remained generally good. Her only concern was how her host would greet her. As Yvonne walked, the heat intensified. The sun, at its zenith, seemed ready to scorch anyone in its path. At one point, Yvonne's head spun, but she managed to steady herself against the trunk of a young tree. It's okay, just a little further, she reassured herself, realising how foolish she must look. Here I am, in the middle of nowhere, with no clear purpose. What did I expect? A welcoming committee? Finally, Yvonne reached the manor, concealed behind a high fence of weathered boards. She paused, searching for the house number on the mailbox, which was rusted and covered in cobwebs. At last, she found the number, barely visible beneath the grime. With a resigned sigh, Yvonne pressed the doorbell. Silence. She stood frozen, anxiety tightening her chest. Did I get the wrong address? Nervously adjusting her purse, Yvonne double-checked the note from her husband. Everything matched. Suddenly, the door swung open. Yvonne recoiled in horror as a gaunt young man with harsh features appeared, aiming a hunting rifle at her. "'Who are you, and what do you want?' he rasped. Yvonne's breath caught, and she stumbled backward, struggling to comprehend the situation. "'I'm... I'm Yvonne,' she stammered. "'Yvonne, I don't understand,' the man frowned lowering his gun slightly, but not removing it. Cyrus Bright's wife, he said you needed help, she blurted out fearfully. Cyrus, has he lost his mind sending his own wife? The man whispered, lowering his weapon. Cyrus said you can't get up after surgery, that it was unsuccessful and the chemotherapy didn't work. I have your address right here, Yvonne murmured. Christopher snatched the note, scanned it quickly, and tossed it to the ground. Get out of here. I don't need any help. I'll be gone soon enough. There'll be no one to take care of, the businessman replied weakly. Yvonne stood dumbfounded, unable to believe her ears. 
had she come all this way only to be dismissed. But what about? Yvonne began to protest, but Christopher cut her off with a sharp gesture. I told you to leave and never come back. I've changed my mind. You're probably here for the inheritance, but I've left almost everything to orphanages. It's safer that way. Children will never betray. Yvonne stood in the doorway, tired and hurt. She couldn't believe she was being sent away like this. When she looked into Christopher's eyes, she saw his exhaustion. The whole scene with the gun had drained his last reserves of strength. Despite his bravado, he clearly needed help. Well, that's it. I've said all I have to say. Christopher struggled to keep his balance. Yvonne pressed her lips together resentfully and slammed the gate without saying goodbye. She had barely taken a couple of steps when she heard a muffled groan and a loud metallic clang behind her. Instantly, she threw her suitcase aside and rushed back into the yard. Christopher had lost his balance and fallen on the porch steps. He lay on his back, head thrown back. The shotgun lay a little farther away, pointing towards the neighbor's property. I knew this would happen, Yvonne exclaimed as she hurried to help. At that moment, she felt no anger or resentment toward Christopher only concern. Was it his fault he wanted to be alone? That he didn't want anyone to see his weakness? Yvonne helped Christopher to his feet and guided him into the house. He mumbled something incomprehensible, but she didn't listen. Quiet now. You're not well, she murmured. Only when he was settled on the old, worn-out sofa did Christopher calm down and stop resisting her help. Without a word, Yvonne retrieved her suitcase from the street and brought it inside. "'I'm sorry for lashing out at you,' Christopher said, lowering his eyes guiltily. "'Some locals thought I'd brought bags of money with me and wanted to rob me. I scared them off with my grandfather's shotgun. It's not even loaded. I don't have any bullets. It's just for show.' He switched to addressing her by her first name. Yvonne smiled. "'I understand. It's all right.' But please, don't point a gun at someone, especially someone who wants to help you. Christopher nodded, then remarked, Yes, I understand. But you didn't just come here out of the goodness of your heart, did you? Many people have shown up like this, practically with a notary in tow. But I value normal relationships more, and you don't need to pity me. I've been through this. I don't pity you. What makes you think that? Yvonne asked, surprised. Christopher shook his head. Well, everyone says that at first. Take my wife, Lisa. At first she nursed me, said everything would work out. But when the operation failed, she immediately started talking about company shares. I gave her her part of it, of course, all fair and square. These days, she doesn't even remember me. My phone's covered in dust, not a single call, and she filed for divorce. Yvonne sighed sympathetically, then looked around assessing the house from a woman's perspective. She opened the pantry, then peered into the old refrigerator. Both were a mess. The kitchen looked uninviting, but what could one expect from a man who had come here to die? Dirty curtains hung unwashed at the windows. There was a hole in the tablecloth, and a grimy electric stove sat on the table. Hmm... There's a lot of work to be done here. Well, where shall we start? Yvonne thought with a smile. She examined Christopher's medications, studying the prescription list and appointment schedule. The businessman had already fallen asleep, exhausted by the incident with the gun. No sooner had Yvonne looked up than there was a quiet knock at the door. She startled. Though she hadn't been in the village long, she'd already grown accustomed to the silence and solitude. Slowly she got up and walked to the door, peering through the narrow opening. An elderly man in his eighties with a long white beard and kind, slightly sad eyes stood at the door. "'I'm sorry to disturb you. I'm Mr. Della Rosa, your neighbour, the visitor said, a little embarrassed. "'I'm Yvonne. Please come in,' she replied, opening the door wider. Mr. Della Rosa stepped over the threshold 
and looking around the spacious entrance hall smiled. It's a nice house, but it needs a woman's touch, he said, shouldering off a bag that resembled a pilgrim's sack from fairy tales. Thank you. Please have a seat, Yvonne replied, gesturing to a chair. I hear that Christopher is very ill, Mr. Dalarosa continued, or taking the offered seat. Yes, it seems so. He says the operation was unsuccessful, and the disease is progressing rapidly, Yvonne replied, feeling a strange inattention. Don't worry, it's not fatal. I'm personally sure he can be saved. I tell you this as a former medical worker, Mr. Delarosa reassured her, looking into her sad eyes. Yvonne raised an eyebrow in surprise. So you're a doctor? Well, not really. I was a doctor, but I left the hospital. Now I treat people with herbs, Mr. Delarosa replied, smiling. With herbs? Yvonne exclaimed incredulously. Of course, do you doubt it? Everything can be cured if you only know how. I'll show you what I have, replied the guest, rising from his chair and approaching his bag. Opening it, he smiled. The house immediately filled with the scent of herbs and dried flowers. The healer's bag contained various bunches, roots, seeds and dried petals. Here, look, this is an infusion of valerian root. It calms the nerves and strengthens the heart muscle, said Mr. Delarosa, taking out a small glass jar with a brown liquid. Yvonne looked at the contents with interest. She had never seen or heard of such treatments. And where did you learn this? she asked, still sceptical about the possibility of healing with herbs. From my grandmother. She was a real healer. She said that every herb has power. You just have to know how to extract it, answered Mr. Delarosa, smiling again. And why did you leave the hospital? Yvonne asked her interest in this unusual story growing. Mr. Delarosa sat down at the table, and taking a small thermos out of his bag, poured hot tea into two cups. I didn't leave. I was laid off, he replied, taking a small sip. Fired? For what? Yvonne was genuinely surprised. For treating people with herbs. My co-workers and superiors said it wasn't scientific. They claimed herbs were insufficient, and that we needed only pills or injections. I argued, trying to prove that the method works. They sent me for a psychiatric examination, saying I'd lost my mind. My whole career was ruined. My wife left me for another man, and I became a laughing stock in the department. Obviously, the head of the department and the chief doctor were in cahoots with the pharmacies. I was speaking the truth bluntly. So... They kicked me out, framed me for stealing drugs. The case went to trial, but fell apart. The judge had once personally taken my course of herbal therapy. Successfully, I might add. She couldn't condemn me. That's how it is, replied Mr. Delarosa, gazing into his cup. So do you think there's power in herbs after all? Yvonne asked, feeling her respect for this mysterious elderly man growing by the minute. I think every method has a right to exist, and I'm sure Christopher can still be saved. He's young, and can still do a lot in his life. Well, I should be going now. I've been here long enough. I'll leave some potions for you. Take them three times a day, a tablespoon before meals. Mr. Delarosa replied, putting his cup aside and getting up from the table. Yvonne nodded and went to see him off. At the door, the elderly man said, I've been to Christopher before, offering him treatment, but he wouldn't take it. And those caregivers he had before were absolutely useless. They only laughed at me, called me a sorcerer. I'm not a sorcerer, Yvonne. I just know more than most about herbs. I understand. Please come again. I'm going to clean up the house, then cook some food. I'll be glad to have you as a guest, smiled Yvonne, watching the tall slightly hunched figure of the village herbalist leave. Back in the house, Yvonne pondered what to do first. The old wallpaper was peeling off. The floors creaked and the garden was overgrown, with everything from young trees and weeds to wild roses that braided half the house. Well, 
This is what it's like to live without a woman's touch, thought Yvonne again, looking at the unkempt vegetable garden. First, she tidied up Christopher's room, changed the bedding, put a vase of blooming flowers on the table and lit a scented candle. Then she went into the kitchen. She washed and scrubbed the old pots and pans until they shone and filled the refrigerator with fresh food. Now we can start living normally, she said to herself with satisfaction and smiled. That same day, on her way to the grocery store, Yvonne met one of the locals, who immediately realised she wasn't just a passing visitor, but came for a long time. The month flew by. The neighbours were surprised to see the transformation of Christopher's house. Everything gradually changed for the better. An old gazebo emerged from the overgrown garden, and in the vegetable patch, the first sprouts of parsley, onions and dill began to appear. Even though it was planted late, something would grow. Yvonne is a true magician. She has a green thumb with flowers in the garden, and she's wonderful with people too. I wish she could bring Christopher back to life, the locals used to say, and Mr. Delarosa only laughed, responding, She'll be able. Christopher, however, still lived as a recluse, spending his days in his room and only occasionally agreeing to walk in the woods. Meanwhile, he continued to drink Timothy's grandfather's potions. His estate boasted not only the main house, but also a huge barn filled to the brim with all sorts of junk, from rusty rakes to an old motorcycle. One early morning, Yvonne woke up to a strange noise. Descending the stairs, she found Christopher on the veranda, attempting to start his grandfather's motorcycle, which he had somehow managed to extract from the shed. "'Christopher, what on earth are you doing?' she asked, astonished. "'I just wanted to go for a ride, to relive my youth before I die. It's been so long since I've raced, and my hands are itching,' Christopher replied, his eyes fixed on the old bike. "'But you're still ill. What if something happens on the road?' Yvonne worried. Christopher, true to form, merely waved his hand, insisting it couldn't get any worse. He mounted the motorcycle and slowly drove down the street, leaving the worrying woman behind. Yvonne watched him go, her heart heavy with anxiety, feeling the worst. Yet she realised she couldn't keep Christopher confined against his will. He returned about an hour later, tired but elated. "'How did you manage not to fall?' Yvonne asked, preparing him some herbal tea. "'Honestly, I'm not sure myself. It just happened naturally. My body's still weak, but I managed to control the bike. Though I must admit, there were a couple of moments when I thought, "'This is it, Christopher,' the businessman confessed. Yvonne smiled. "'You'll definitely pull through, Christopher, and that's what matters most. Remember, you're not alone.' You have me and Mr. De La Rosa. Though you may not believe in his potions, they've clearly helped. A month ago you could barely hold a spoon, and now you're riding a motorcycle. What makes you so certain? Christopher asked, smiling for the first time since they'd met. Because I see the strength in you. You're a fighter, and you'll go the distance, Yvonne replied, gazing into his eyes. From that memorable day, their relationship began to warm gradually. Christopher started to open up more to Yvonne, sharing stories about his life. She listened attentively, never interrupting. "'You're my guardian angel,' Christopher said one evening, looking at Yvonne. "'You came into my life, and everything changed.' "'Well, you change everything yourself by finding the strength to fight on.' I just helped you find the right path, she replied with a smile. I'm deeply grateful to you, Christopher said. They looked at each other, their eyes reflecting a warmth, trust, and something more that only they understood. I think we should go outside. The fresh air and nature are beautiful. Are you up for it? Yvonne suggested, rising from the table. I agree, but first, I'd like to see you smile, Christopher replied. 
Yvonne blushed and smiled. They stepped out onto the veranda to watch the sunset. The sun had begun its descent, painting the sky in vibrant shades of red and orange. You know, it's been ages since I've witnessed such beauty, Yvonne confessed, inhaling the crisp evening air. Neither have I, but now I see it twice as vividly, Christopher replied, draping his arm around her shoulders. At that moment, Yvonne realised she wasn't just caring for Christopher. She was helping him truly live again. But of course, Yvonne hesitated. After all, she was married. Yet, throughout this time, her husband hadn't even bothered to call her. Most likely, he and his mother were scheming for Yvonne to secure them wealth through Christopher's inheritance. However, during this month, Yvonne not only refused Christopher's money, but even offered him to quit his business endeavours and settle in the village. He nodded in agreement, then sank into pensive reflection. His name had once carried weight in business circles, but where were his friends and associates now? They had probably long forgotten him and given up. Perhaps they were just waiting for his obituary to appear in official sources. But Christopher wouldn't give them that satisfaction so easily. He would fight on, not alone, of course, but with Yvonne and his kind neighbour the herbalist by his side. How wonderful that Yvonne has come! It's as if spring has arrived in our village. She has breathed new life into everything, Mr. Delarosa said with a smile during a conversation with the local postman, Tom. That's right, she's a good woman, no argument there. She has our village spirit. Say, Mr. Delarosa, why doesn't she work at the school? She's a teacher, after all, Tom asked. The elderly herbalist raised an eyebrow in surprise. You must be joking, Tom. Who would look after Christopher? He'd wither away alone. Besides, the school is in the district centre. If only we had a school nearby. Well, that would be different. Tom looked at the former doctor with interest. Actually, there was a school, not in our village, but in the neighbouring one, about a kilometre and a half away. However, the roof is cracked from the last hurricane. It's completely unusable, and the floors are rotten. Mr. Delarosa's eyes lit up with a peculiar gleam. At first, the postman didn't understand its meaning, but then he guessed. Listen, Mr. Delarosa, why don't you ask Christopher for money for repairs? He attended that school himself until fifth grade, before moving to the city with his father after his mother's death. In response, the elderly doctor shrugged his shoulders uncertainly, not wanting his plans to be known prematurely. First, Christopher had to overcome his illness, which wasn't as simple as it seemed. Sometimes a person goes into remission and feels hopeful, but complications can return at any moment. So while Christopher seemed to have revived, the final victory was still far off. Once, to cheer him up, Mr. Delarosa suggested that he and Yvonne go to the forest together to gather herbs. To his surprise, the young people agreed with pleasure. The day passed splendidly. Yvonne's trophy was a basket of wild berries, and Christopher, still thin and pale from illness, carried a small bucket of mushrooms. Mr. Delarosa walked beside them, leaning on a stick with a bag full of herbs in front of him. We had a lovely walk, Yvonne said happily, setting the basket down on a stump by the forest path. Christopher sat down tiredly beside it, placing his bucket down. "'I'll tell you something, Yvonne. Where to find a lot of raspberries?' smiled the elderly doctor. "'Next time, perhaps. For now, it's time to head home. It's getting late,' Yvonne replied. "'Mr. Delarosa, may I help you with your bag?' Christopher asked. "'No, dear, I'll carry it myself,' replied the elderly man, leaning on his stick. But after a few steps he suddenly staggered and collapsed into a hidden pit. Yvonne and Christopher rushed to the edges of the damp, branch-strewn hole into which the elderly man had fallen. "'Mr. Delarosa, are you all right?' Yvonne asked anxiously. "'Yes, I'm fine. I've fallen into what seems to be a wolf pit. Curse those wicked poachers!' he muttered, 
looking at the ground. Christopher and Yvonne began to lift Mr. De La Rosa and, despite the elderly man's thin frame, they struggled to pull him back to solid ground. Ugh! Oh, it's so deep! Yvonne exclaimed, shaking off the dirt. It certainly isn't small, said Christopher, helping Mr. De La Rosa to sit up. Thank you, my dears, you're my saviours, the man said, smiling. After resting for a while, the trio marked the hole with a pile of dry twigs and headed home. Christopher walked beside the elderly doctor, supporting him under his arm, while Yvonne followed, keeping an eye on both of them. Mr. De La Rosa, how are you feeling? she asked as they approached the village. Much better now, thank you, Yvonne. My leg is still a bit sore, but I'm sure it will pass soon, he replied. That's good, Yvonne said with a smile. Deep down she was glad to have befriended the old doctor. It was a great opportunity to learn more about the forest than she had ever known before. A couple more weeks passed. Yvonne and Christopher went to the forest many more times with Mr. De La Rosa, collecting herbs, berries and mushrooms. Christopher felt much better, and the elderly man was delighted, finally, to have friendly neighbours who cared for him and helped in all his endeavours. One day, Mr. De La Rosa took a moment to tell Christopher that the school in the neighbouring village needed repairs. The businessman listened patiently, then expressed his desire to allocate money for the repairs. I had no idea what was going on there, Mr. De La Rosa. You probably know that I studied there, so it would be a matter of honour for me to help. The elderly man smiled. Thank you, Christopher. I guess that's what we've been missing. Financial help and support. Christopher smiled and looked at Yvonne. By the lingering glances between the young people, the elderly neighbour immediately realised that something special was developing between them, understood only by the two of them. To Yvonne's credit, she repeatedly tried to call her husband, but Cyrus persistently ignored her calls. At first, Yvonne thought her husband was simply too busy to answer, but as it continued, she realised he had left her to her fate. Interestingly, Michaela also refused to answer the phone, flatly refusing to communicate with her daughter-in-law. She had essentially written off Yvonne, assuming she would stay with Christopher until the businessman passed away, leaving a substantial inheritance to his caregiver. But they didn't know that long ago Yvonne made it clear that she didn't want any remuneration. No, Christopher, better give the money to orphanages. It was a really good idea. I don't need it but if you renovate the school in the neighbouring village, I could work there. That's all I need. Christopher nodded, realising how hard her life had been, and he was really surprised when he learned the real reason for Yvonne's dismissal. That's outrageous, exclaimed Christopher. We should initiate a prosecutor's audit against that principal. Let them deal with him properly. What was he thinking? Yvonne shook her head. No, I don't want to cause trouble. If they fire him, another will come. Let the parents decide what's more important to them, an honest grade of their kids or a comforting lie. As a teacher of the old school, Yvonne never pandered to parents. She told the truth when necessary, focusing on imparting valuable knowledge to children. Like every teacher, she dreamed of seeing her students surpass her achievements. Yvonne aspired to nurture famous and talented individuals among her graduates. Mr. De La Rosa's treatment clearly benefited Christopher, as evidenced by his examination at a regional clinic. The doctors were baffled. For inexplicable reasons, Christopher's body had overcome the spread of the disease, achieving a stable remission. I don't know what you've been taking, Christopher Igorovich, but it's nothing short of miraculous exclaimed the doctor who conducted the study. Christopher merely smiled, remembering Mr. De La Rosa's expertise, a man once considered crazy and fired from his job. From that day, Christopher felt reinvigorated. He realised that all along he had been receiving the right treatment under his kind neighbour's guidance. 
While doctors marveled at the unique changes in his body, Christopher chuckled inwardly, knowing that behind this uniqueness lay the hard work of Yvonne and Mr. Delarosa. Two months after Yvonne's departure, Cyrus grew visibly anxious. He had expected his wife to return within days, given her city-dwelling nature and lack of adaptation to village life. Despite her periodic calls, Cyrus deliberately avoided answering. Mum, do you think she's already inherited the money? What if we're in the dark here? Cyrus asked ingratiatingly. Michaela wrinkled her nose. I doubt it. I've been following incident reports and obituaries. There's been no news of Christopher Hoover's death, so he's likely still alive, though probably dying. Cyrus pondered this, his mother's words sowing doubt. Has he really lasted this long? The doctors gave him so little time. Listen, Mum, I think I need to go to the village and investigate. I'm worried. What if Yvonne has inherited the money and is spending it while we wait around? Michaela raised an eyebrow. Well, it's up to you, son, but I doubt that simpleton could outsmart us. Without delay, Cyrus set off for the village. The next morning, en route to the village, he fantasized about dividing the inheritance and what pittance he'd give Yvonne, just enough for a shopping spree at a fashion store. He reasoned, what did she expect? I found this golden opportunity and set her up with Christopher. Without me, she'd have nothing. Upon arriving in the village, Cyrus's expensive car immediately drew attention, a rare sight that turned heads. Approaching the house, Cyrus honked thrice. Certain no one would answer, he headed for the gate. To his shock, he found Christopher alive and well. Hello, Cyrus. Come to check if I'm still breathing? The host asked with a smile. Visibly flustered, Cyrus stammered, No, it's just... Well, my wife Yvonne left and there's been no news from her since. Christopher shook his head reproachfully. Well, Cyrus, you've really done it this time. You sent your wife to me without telling her anything. She was suffering here, poor thing. But it's all right. Yvonne has got used to it and is going to stay here. Cyrus blanched. What? What do you mean, stay here? Christopher grinned. With me, of course. Oh, and prepare yourself for divorce. Papers will be coming soon. Blood rushed to Cyrus's head. In a fit of anger, he grabbed Christopher's sweatshirt sleeve, but the businessman easily shoved him away. Cyrus lost his balance and sprawled into a puddle. As he fell, the cunning guest immediately felt Christopher's strength and realised his health had clearly improved since their last meeting. What do you think you're doing? Where's Yvonne? I want to talk to my wife. A drenched Cyrus shouted at the top of his lungs. Christopher shrugged and opened the door indifferently. I'm not stopping you. Come and talk to her. You couldn't do it for a couple of months, could you? So... What's changed now? Suddenly need your wife? Yvonne called you almost every day, but you didn't pick up. Too busy, right? Well, now she's busy. And not with just anyone, but with me personally. Cyrus was speechless with surprise. To be honest, he had expected to hear anything but this. What is this? While I patiently waited for Yvonne to inherit, she was carrying on with this money man. Soon, his wife came out onto the... Seeing Cyrus's altered expression, she said, Hello, are you here as a guest or for good? Cyrus shook his head confused. What do you mean for good? She smirked. Well, you asked me to take care of Christopher to get a good inheritance. Now, you have that opportunity. Why don't you woo him further? Cyrus turned purple with rage. So this is what you've been up to. You're conspiring against me on purpose. Well, I'll make your life miserable. Don't even think about getting a divorce. And you won't get anything if you divorce me. 
Understand? Yvonne shook her head. I didn't doubt it. What could I possibly get from you? The house is yours and your mother's, even though we saved the money for it together. I'd rather stay here in the village with Christopher and work at the local school than listen to your reproaches every day. Realizing he'd accomplished nothing here, Cyrus decided to leave, especially since Christopher threatened him with a charge of buckshot if he appeared again. Back home, Cyrus told his mother what had happened. Cursing her daughter in law at every turn, Michaela berated herself for making such an unfortunate mistake by not controlling everything at once. It's all because of my laziness, the mother in law barked to herself. However, Yvonne didn't care. With Christopher's suggestion, the school in the neighboring village would be repaired, and soon teachers from other schools would return to teach the local children. But when the question arose as to who would become the principal, everyone pointed to Yvonne. She smiled and shook her head. Oh, come on, what kind of principal would I be? Let someone with more experience take that role. I want to teach language and literature as before. Four months passed. Christopher looked with obvious approval at the woman he had recently considered his fiance. The school was renovated in record time, for money, as we know, can work wonders. Not always, of course, but that doesn't change the essence of the matter. Cyrus, as promised, began to obstruct the divorce in every possible way. In the end, he even brought the case to court, which, of course, disgraced himself on the whole city and the region. This was because Yvonne and Christopher didn't keep silent, telling the court everything as it was, including the matter of the will. Having exposed himself to public ridicule, Cyrus realized he was now an outcast. His mother, Michaela, shared his fate, having forgotten, in her pursuit of profit, that one shouldn't dig a pit for another lest one fall into it oneself. As for Yvonne, she was thriving at her new workplace. The school's principal was an honest and principled man, who never compromised his conscience and always did what a true teacher should do. In less than a year and a half, Yvonne received more good news. Ironically, it coincided with the news of her pregnancy. She learned she had been nominated for the Teacher of the Year Award. In due time, the award finally found its heroine. Looking at his wife, Christopher smiled and silently thanked fate for bringing him together with this woman, who had first become his caregiver, then his fiancée, and now his life partner.